Welcome back to another episode of Be On Air. I'm your host, Kaylee Marks. Today's guest is, today's esteemed guest is an incredible human being. And I, uh, I count myself very fortunate that I get the opportunity to interview him. He's actually the manager of my, my dear mentor and hero, Jeff McBride. And his name is Tobias Beckwith, and he is an author, producer, director, manager, teacher, speaker, influencer, and last but not least, a magician. After earning his master's degree and teaching theater arts at the University of Pittsburgh, Tobias Beckwith moved to New York City to discover what the real world of theater might be like. He landed on the management and production teams of the long-running Fantastics and O oh, Calcutta and spent two years working on the original Broadway and first touring show of Sweeney Todd. He then began helping world-renowned magician, illusionist, and teacher of magic, Jeff McBride, to develop his first full evening show and became his manager and producer of all his shows since. Tobias has managed, directed, and advised many other magicians as well as authored five books, three for magicians and two for a more general audience. I'm really excited to get into our conversation today, so stick around. Don't compare journeys. Your journey is your specific journey, and you will be guided to the best way to get you where we go. I believe that right now is a great opportunity to leverage the power of voice. David Copperfield is a billionaire. Not a millionaire, he's a billionaire. And how did he become this? He tapped into something profound, which is the art of storytelling. Be on air. Powered by Podcast Farm. Tobias Beckwith, welcome to Be On Air. It's so great to have you. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you. I was listening to all that. It would sound really impressive if I was 30 years old, but I'm, I'm, I'm considerably older than that. So I've had a lot of time to do those things. I, uh, I... I think that you're very humble, and honestly, I'm honored that you've come out to the show. I've gotten the privilege of getting to see you speak, see you share magic, see you just in the Magic and Mystery School, which we'll get into later in the episode. And uh, when Jeff kind of reached out and said that you might be interested in coming onto the show, I was really um, just grateful and excited. And I have some, yeah. I have some very exciting questions for me to ask today. But I thought a good place to start. You know, you've been in theater for such a long time, and I do have a lot of entertainers and performers that tune into the show. And I was mm -hmm. wondering, what is theater for you? Well, I used to teach theater, so I have a, an academic answer to that. And that that's when a performer interacts with an, a live audience member, someone who is actually there and can react back. So right now we're, we're in an interesting place because we can do that online. 20 years ago, we couldn't. We had film or TV and you could perform, but you couldn't, and that was not the same as theater. Theater is the live interaction, the thing that happens between the performer and the audience. And so it can be one performer sitting across the table from one audience member, as in some close-up shows, or it can be you know, a performer or a Broadway musical performing for three or 4,000 people in a giant theater. As long as both sides are live, that's theater. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that. And what what is it for you on a deeper, more philosophical level, on a heart level? I'm curious. Well, you know, I moved to theater I, when I was really young. When I was like six or seven years old, I got fascinated with magic and tricks. And then I kind of drifted away because most of the magic I saw wasn't very magical. But theatrical productions, Broadway musicals, could make you laugh so hard that you wanted to roll on the ground and cry. And to me, that was more magical than than magic shows at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I, I grew up in the, the 60s and the 70s. So magic was very different then from what it is now. David Copperfield wasn't on the scene yet. Jeff McBride wasn't on the scene yet. And so magic was, was the old traditional, let me show you, a, a trick kid and you know here's a silk and here's in it and it looked kind of corny and kind of the the tricks were fun the fooling was fun but you know un unless you actually got to go to the magic castle and see shimada or someone it it wasn't very magical mm -hmm. and theater was because to me the the, the real magic is, is what moves you what changes you magic is really transformation 
and theater has a power to do that. Films have a power to do that in a different way, very similar, but but also very different. And uh, to me, that was the real magical experience. And I wasn't getting it from seeing tricks back then. What what when did magic start to deliver that for you? When what was the what was the connect? And actually, you know, let's back up yeah. a little bit. What is sure. when did magic kind of enter your life in a in a in a more as more of an art and less of tricks and foolery and more as a connection to theater. Yeah. Well, I I had an idea that it could do that. So my uh, my my career in New York was, was fantastic for several years and then Sweeney Todd for several years and then O Calcutta which was a horrible show but taught me more about show business than anything else. <laughs> and while I was there, I developed computerized systems. Nobody was using computers then. It was uh, mm -hmm. the, the mid 80s. And, and I went up and down the, the, the street on Broadway and talked to every producer and said, you should put these in your offices. And they all went, eh, I don't think so. I said, we, we have our ways that work. And so I got the job at O'Calcutta and the producer there said, go for it. Mm -hmm. And we put computers in the offices. And my job as a company manager and theater manager, which is what I was doing for him, went from eight hours of work a day, six days a week, down to two hours of day uh, of work a week. And I had free time in the afternoons. I'd go in and work from 10 to noon. And then I had the afternoon off before the show started. And I thought, well, what can I do with this? I worked with some dance companies. I did some other things. And it came to me that nonprofit was a bad word for, for funded theater and for funded dance. And that these, performances would be better if they had to make a living. Mm. My, 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 my commentary was, you know, Shakespeare would not have written 30 some plays if he didn't have to have a new play every other week <laughs> for the audience at his theater in order to eat, in order mm -hmm. to make a living. And if, if, if all that money comes into you as grants and this kind of thing, I got very frustrated writing grants because we would, we'd have a concert that we knew was gonna cost us $30,000 and we'd write grants for 25,000 of it because the real profit was only gonna be, you know, the, the real revenues were only gonna be 5,000. I said, there's something wrong with this picture. Mm -hmm. I'm spending part of my day working on a terrible show that's making money on Broadway and the other part doing these wonderful esoteric dance things that are losing money mm -hmm. everywhere. Maybe if they could be more commercial, maybe if we could add some magic into the dance and tell a story with the magic, I'd be happier both with the magic and the dance and we would start to make money. And of, of course the, the choreographers and people that I knew were not that interested in that. They wanted to do their pure choreography and not. So I gathered four or five dancers who were friends and a choreographer and I met, a, I, I had a friend who was a magician who had been performing as Rooster, the original Rooster in Annie um, named Bob Fitch. And Bob came in as our magic advisor. And we worked four or five weeks trying to create this story with music. We had original music we had, and it was just not quite gelling. And Bob gave me, a, he said, here, call Jeff McBride. He understands movement in magic in a way that nobody else in the magic world does. And uh, so I went to see Jeff in Atlantic City and went, yeah, he kind of does. We should talk. And I'm really excited about what he has because he had a great 20 minutes. He was an opening act then. Um, I saw him opening for Raquel Welch, who, who his manager also managed. But he had opened for Diana Ross and Cheap Trick and Peter Allen and Tom Jones and all these other people by then. It was a great 20 minutes, but it wasn't a full show. Mm -hmm. And... I said, you know, you should do a full show. There are some other people out there doing great full evening magic. And he wanted to. And I said, well, let's let's work on it together. No, no charge, nothing. But if we can get it in shape, I'll produce it for you. And so that was my, you know, I, I was very excited about the kind of magic that Jeff did. I spent two or three years trying to convince him not to call himself a magician because he was a pantomime and a mass, you know, used masks and martial art and kabuki theater. And incidentally, world-class sleight of hand and some illusions, but that was only a small part of the theatrical experience that he delivered. And at that time he was opening and closing with masks. So his show was really about, I put on the mask and gain power and then I show you all the power. And in the end, I can't take the mask off because the power's in the mask and mm -hmm. it was this struggle. 
So when you ended that struggle, it was cataclysmic. It was an amazing piece of theater, not just magic. And it would bring audiences to their feet immediately. And so it was really fun to structure those early shows around how, how that worked theatrically, not just as a magic show. And so it was, it was really Jeff. And uh, it, when, when, we, when he signed a management contract a couple of years later, because his manager, who had managed Raquel Welch, got um, Hodgkin's disease and mm. AIDS and took a year and a half to die. And Jeff asked me to be his manager. Mm. And our first contract said, no other magicians. You can manage other artists, but not other magicians. I said, that's fine. I'm really not into being a manager. I want to be a producer. I will manage you to serve your needs, but that's not what I... And about a year later, he came to me and said, oh, there's this Swiss kid named Marco Tempest who recently split up with his partner and is doing a solo career. And I know I told you not to do other magicians, but if you wanted to, you could work with Marco, who is the other most theatrical, interesting magician I know. And I, I worked with him for 30 years. And so between the two of them, I got fascinated with magic again, but it was a different kind of magic than the kind that have kind of, had kind of driven me away from magic. And yeah. Yeah. So what I heard from you earlier was the, uh, the transformation in, in affecting the audience, that the audience actually goes through some internal journey and transformation and experiences something powerful and profound that's the real magic and the tricks and the and the effects are sort of uh, vehicles or vessels by which that transformation happens and you know i i really recommend that everyone listening goes and checks out jeff mcbride on youtube so you can put some visuals to what tobias is is sharing but i also feel like you you have a really nice visual picture of his show and you know one question that came up for me is how like how do you go about starting to produce a show is there any strategy or framework about how you start to work on a show because i think podcasts you know obviously there's true crime there's audio dramas yeah. but then there's even this interview format so how would you for, especially yeah. for the listeners i'm always trying to think about how can we serve whoever's listening right now how can a podcast or a host kind of look at their own show or bring on a producer and and start to improve the quality and improve the impact that it has. Absolutely. I, I kind of think a podcast, I kind of think any kind of a show. I'm sorry, my, my equipment's making noise here. We got special sound effects for you. Nice. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> it, it says I'm supposed to do a podcast. Oh, um, it's a little late. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I always come back to I, I, I got my, my MFA was as a director from from University of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And as part of that study, one of the most effective books I, I got to read was by Peter Brook. It's called The Empty Space. And Peter Brook was a famous director, one of the founders of the, the Royal Shakespeare Company in London and those things. And he talks about each different kind of theater from street theater, which he calls poor theater or rough theater to Broadway theater, which is drama and, and cultured theater to, to religious theater, which is, you know, a, a whole different venue. And he said, it's important to know what kind of theater you're doing, but what it really comes down to is what's this for? What do I want from this? What do I want the effect to be? Do I want to change somebody's politics? Do I just want to entertain people at the end of, you know, a hard work day and give them something to laugh and let them feel lighter? Or do I want to reinforce this, you know, dogma religion like um, they, they used to do, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of them, uh, passion plays, which were these, you know, like they'd set up eight eight stages around the town square outside the cathedral and reenact the whole passion. And the reason was for the same reason people go to go to church every week to reinforce their belief system, to, to bring them together in a community and reinforce. So, so there are different reasons for doing any kind of theater, any kind of show. And if you can answer the question at the beginning, what do I want from this? What is this for? that will help you create something that is useful, that, that's exciting to your audiences and to you and uh, over the long haul. A, an example in podcasts, I, I watched Jason Calacanis, who is This Week in Startups, because I'm fascinated by the whole startup 
phenomenon in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. the, these companies that go from zero to a billion dollars in 10 years and the people that drive them and their drive. And his podcast is to serve that community. It, it was originally to serve the founders. Now it's to serve founders and angel investors. And he's very clear about that. And he has developed, if, if you watch his podcast, it's exactly what you would expect. It's the top people in that industry mm -hmm. in a setting that is more sophisticated than it used to be. It used to look like he was, you know, in his, in his, you know, personal office with, with no set and no nothing. And now it's developed into a fully produced with with an appropriate set with you know that kind of thing but he's been clear from the beginning about what that's for and i think that's the thing it's, it's certainly what keeps me tuning in week after week i know what i'm going to get i know what it's for and uh that 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 that's the big key for me yeah so i heard um what do i want from this and what is it for and then i would also add like who is it for right in, absolutely in and so maybe we could even just use my show as a guinea pig for a second. Sure. Um, so you, you know, it's, I have, I, I'm just going to open it up. Would you give some live feedback as a producer? Would you be willing to grace me with some live pr production feedback about how this could improve? And that might be cool for the audience to hear and listen to. And you have full sure. permission as direct feedback as you want. I, I won't have any hurt feelings here. No worries. I, I think, I think we can do that in a slightly different, different way than you're yeah. suggesting. Let me ask you some questions. Okay. Who is your audience? Who's your market that you're really going after that you want to serve with this? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Well, so the, the way that I think about it is conscious creators and purposeful entrepreneurs, broadly speaking, there's a lot of coaches, there's a lot of speakers and authors listening and, um, yeah, there, I mean, there's definitely other people listening. So if I didn't mention a, a category that fits you, dear listener, please reach out and tell me how you identify yourself. But I would say, broadly speaking, that's yeah. that fits almost everyone. Yeah. So so that is a very that, that's a definite community, and it's it's it is creators. I assume you mean all kinds of creators from course creators, artists, from knitters to performers to to people creating podcasts and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, but they are by definition creative. That, that, that's who, who is going to come watch this, who, who is going to be served by it. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously you're going to have people like that as guests or people, or people who can help that as your guests. Um, people that can teach those people to, to either either maximize their income or maximize their creativity or build a better organization or you know what, whatever that takes um, and and over the years I've, I've come to see that because I, I, I started out as, as actor director choreographer designer all the creative things except business mm -hmm. and I had a scorn for business business was like what the producers do the people who aren't creative and moving to New York and becoming a company manager and a producer, I very soon realized that every business decision in a creative business is also a creative decision. Every creative decision is a business decision. Mm -hmm. if, if I cut the chorus by three people, that saves me a certain amount of money every week, and therefore I can change the ticket price and therefore I can serve a different audience. And these are creative choices. What's it all for? Mm -hmm. And it, it all comes back to that. So um, where, where, where are you? How do people find out about your podcast? Would yeah. Be another question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, many places. So I have a lot of touch points, uh, Facebook group. I have the, the actual podcast. So if anyone's subscribed, then they get it onto their phone. I'm on all podcast platforms, uh, YouTube, Clubhouse. I go into Clubhouse a lot and tell people about it. Instagram. Mm -hmm. So social networking, you know, it's it, it gets mm -hmm. around that way. Yeah. And um, so, so it, it seems like most people find out about it because they are online. Yes. Yeah. So it is, it, the show is particularly for these conscious creators and purposeful entrepreneurs who are wanting to be online and to broadcast mm -hmm. and amplify their message in their business. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, are there other ways you could reach them? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's probably a lot of different ways that I could reach them. Um, whether that is, 
you know, I do some email marketing and, and just email uh, correspondence and nurturing. So kind of that's one way um, I could be doing even more videos uh, that are specific for YouTube, you know, and, and do more. And I yeah. could also be streaming this live. So this is not live. Uh, but StreamYard yeah. can can stream to multiple platforms live, which is something that I do want to move into because that'll just add this whole other layer of engagement. I would think so. I I know we've discovered with with the the Magic and Mystery School that as soon as we opened up a live broadcast to anybody for free, our our customer base, our community, quadrupled and and more. Almost Can we talk overnight. about that for a second? I mean, yeah, let's talk about that sure. because, yeah. so just for the listeners, um, so the Magic and Mystery School is probably the world's most prestigious and foremost magic and the and the art of astonishment and magic school that exists. And for oh, for over a decade, they've been live streaming, or they for over a decade, they have been producing these incredible shows, and it has become this live streaming like think think of an actual tv show that you would see there's seg there's pre-recorded segments there's live segments there's um david copperfield was on there recently so there is so much going on there could you and when COVID hit when the lockdown hit you opened your doors to the whole magic community and it, it provided this you had world-class doctor magicians on there giving very up-to-date health advice you had just so much inspiration and creativity that was soothing for the community at a time that was very traumatic and stressful so you know can you talk a little bit about that production that you do there because that is a huge operation that you guys are managing absolutely it um it happened i mean certainly the 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 kick in the butt for it was the pandemic and the fact that people can't go out and perform and we said you know these are our people and we had been doing the show for eight or not well we just finished 500 so we, we do it once a week so we had been doing it for maybe nine years before the pandemic hit mm -hmm. but it was for members only and uh, to become a member you had to pay i think 25 dollars a year or 50 or 100 depending on what level you wanted to support the school on and we would get 25 or 30 people a week tuning into the live show and then maybe a thousand after the fact watching it you know via um the via the the posting of of the show because we always post them after the fact but it was a self-selected community mm -hmm. and we thought you know let's everybody's hurting everybody in the world of magic it doesn't really cost us any different to put it on for 30 or 40 people than it would to put it on for a thousand people and we have had a thousand once or twice who who watched it since then and uh and these people need it not only that would it, it would be a good thing because it would draw people in who we want to be in our community and i had been trying to uh, larry haas is our is the dean of the school another magician educator wonderful human being and I had been trying to get Jeff and Larry to start to put some classes on the Zoom platform, which is what we, we broadcast on now. And uh, they had kind of resisted because they really liked doing the live, in-person, interactive in Jeff's house. But Jeff's house, you can't bring more than 20 people in. Mm -hmm. And they have to travel to Las Vegas. And if they're going to be here for three days and pay the cost of coming to Vegas, and the, uh, we, we had to charge more mm -hmm. so we used to charge 700 basically for a three-day class and you had to get yourself here and pay for it and all of that so so it was a 1500 two thousand dollar investment for a student mm -hmm. well that was fine when we could only handle 20 a class and did, did one class essentially one class a month over the course of a year but it severely limited the scope of who we could reach we could only reach people who could afford that or wanted it so bad that they would save their money for you know a, a period of time in order to be able to you know come and join us mm -hmm. and all of a sudden we could teach three different classes every week we could do classes that were only six hours long that were two hours and two hours and two hours and we didn't have to travel they didn't have to travel so we could charge 150 dollars for that kind of a class instead of 700 that we used to mm -hmm. and we could serve people people could come into the class I, I have a class that i do wednesday mornings right now 
and I have somebody in from Barcelona, Spain, and somebody from Thailand, and a bunch of people from the U.S. But we couldn't have done that over the course. That, that that's that, that's a twelve. 12 week business class mm -hmm. that would have been impossible before we were going online. And we discovered very quickly because Jeff, Jeff and Larry were supposed to go to the United Kingdom to do a master class at a performance and a seminar on uh, shaman to showman, the, the relationship of medicine and magic through history. And COVID hit. It was, we, we thought, well, we could probably still get them there, but they're probably not going to be allowed to come home mm -hmm. without quarantine, quarantining. So we called and we said, we have to cancel this. But if you want, we could try and do it online. And both of them, because they're, they're both a little less technically enthusiastic than I am, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. We're going, well, I don't know if we can do it. And, and well, we're going to do it. They, everybody said, yes, we don't want to cancel. We'll do it online. And they were so successful and so much fun that we immediately developed a whole online curriculum, which we're doing now. And we reached four or five times as many students last year as we did any year before that. And we had a lot of fun doing and did develop new classes added to our curriculum. I've always had a, the, the Magic and Mystery School got famous for being, you know, very small, very dedicated and, and the best teachers we could have. Um, hopefully amongst the three of us, but also, you know, Jeff has always brought in outsiders. We've had people like David, David Copperfield come in as a special guest. Jeff has done classes with Alan Ackerman. We bring in Ross Johnson for the mentalism class, who was one of the, certainly the best teachers in the world of mentalism and, and one of the most best known. But now we can do all that online and we can do three different classes during one week instead of one every month. Mm -hmm. And it has, has allowed that thing that happens in the, the online digital revolution to work for the school, for, for growing that. And I, I, I'm, I'm very excited about it. We're certainly going to keep doing the online, even as we, we start doing live ones again. We, we have a couple of live sessions scheduled speaking in of October. Which... Yeah, yeah, and speaking of which, maybe you could tell us a little bit about Magic Quest because you have a very exciting new online show offering. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. We do. I, I hope it's a, a I, I hope it's it's really groundbreaking because um, I'm excited about the whole online phenomenon of interactive online video, and it allows us to do something that we've kind of wanted to do for a long time, but there was no way to do it again because. The school happens at Jeff's house. Jeff's house, he calls it the house of mystery. It's where he is, if, if, if you've ever been there, the walls, there, there, were, there isn't a square inch <laughs> of space on the walls, not filled with masks or magic posters or awards that he's received or his light. He had to add on a section of the house to house his library because there were, was no more room for a single book to come in. And so it's like this museum. It's this magical museum of everything Jeff loves. And we could only invite students in. We couldn't, there was no way to capitalize on this. We, you, know, you, you can't get a, a, an assembly permit to sell tickets to do something in your house mm -hmm. in Las Vegas. But there's nothing to stop us doing the show on Zoom and we can be completely interactive. He can call people out. He can ask people to do things. He can ask everybody to do something at once. So it's interactive like it's theater as though you were in a magic museum, except it's all from his own home. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it's different from other Zoom magic shows anyone will see because it's not just a series of tricks. It's the story of Jeff's quest to find real magic in life from the time he was a kid in school getting in trouble in French class because he was dropping coins on the floor to the time he set a world record, Guinness world record for doing one of those tricks to traveling to Japan. And you see a little bit of him on the, the Mikado, which at the t stage, which was at the time was the world's largest nightclub and where he actually, the, the, the owner took him out and across the street to study Kabuki at the Kabuki Za, which is where they train kabuki theater performers. And then you can see his posters from his shows in New York and from his opening act with Diana Ross at, at, at Radio City. And the story of how his magic progressed through each of those. So at one point he thought it was going one direction and that wasn't satisfying. So he moved it in another direction and that took him here. And it's a whole journey 
to a conclusion that, mm -hmm. that I hope is, is an emotional payoff in a way that you don't get in very many, many magic shows. And it's all possible because of the online platform. We're, we're very excited about it. Yeah, it reminds me of like one door shuts, which is another door opening and it has mm -hmm. given us this platform and you know jeff has honestly made me cry just by doing magic on zoom like i i he is so moving in his in the potency of what he is conveying and i think that ties back to the theatrical element i also wanted to talk to yeah. you a little bit about wizard venture could you yes. could you talk to us about that first of all i love the name you guys always come up with such great names for for the mm -hmm. the classes and the shows and so yeah what is wizard venture thank you that's um well, that's me responding to my own book. I wrote a book called The Wizard's Way, which was originally going to be a way of sharing performer secrets with people outside performance. Um, the idea that, you know, if, if an actor can snap into character in a matter of 10 seconds, there's no reason a business executive can't snap into character in 10 seconds and access more powerful parts of their being than they normally do. Um, performers do this every time they go on stage. You're one person in the wings, and by the time you hit the stage, you're that character, whoever it is. And we become, we do access different parts of ourselves. The person who is really shy and, and afraid to speak up at a meeting and things can suddenly transform themselves into someone who is a powerful speaker and communicator. And there are little tricks to that that actors know that can be useful to business executives or parents or whoever. And if you think about it, we all shift roles all the time, but there are other things too. And um, what it came down to eventually was I shifted from just, per, you know, and magicians learn to direct your attention. Well, politicians know that, but, <laughs> and marketers know it, yeah. but, it's really important to know that the reality people experience is the reality that we call their attention to because people can only really pay attention to one or two things at a time mm -hmm. and so you know when, when when we stage a war in iraq you don't pay attention to the fact that all the vice president's buddies are getting rich by selling arms to the government as a result of that war mm -hmm. and uh because the news and everything we can keep you Fix, fixated on the big picture, the thing we want you to look at. There, there was a movie years ago called Wag the Dog, mm -hmm. which was a great example of this in politics. But these are all useful techniques if you want to change the world, which a lot of businesses do. If, if you're not in business to change the world, if you're only in business to make money, I'm not interested in working with you. So, But the Wizard Venture is there to teach you ways to change the world using the methods not only of performers but but i got interested in real world changers people um my my, my model was merlin the magician mm -hmm. in who, who is probably mythic but there was a very clear story of what merlin did mm -hmm. and it wasn't being a magician it was noticing what's happening in the world he wanted to unite unite the worlds of of roman britain with the pictish the original you know people there and so he found a king who was roman and someone who could be his queen that he was passionate about who was from the other side the pictish and got them together and they had a baby who became king arthur and then he saw that arthur was going to become just like his father if he couldn't get him out of the court and educate him differently and eventually he created king arthur and that whole myth by working behind the scenes. Like a producer. Like a producer or like a director. The, he, he was never the one to step on stage. He was the one pulling the strings behind the stage. And that is a great model. You saw it again with Mohandas Gandhi, who never held any political office, but changed India, created modern India through the, you know, caused, caused the, the Raj to go out after two or 300 years. And the in Indians hated the British, but they didn't have a way to, until Gandhi came along and created nonviolent, mm -hmm. you know, protest and, and all of that, and learned to think differently. That it, it, it comes all the way through Einstein and Richard Feynman and down to Steve Jobs, who actually, you know, my, my favorite commercial of all time is that here's to the crazy ones commercial with, with Einstein and Martin Luther King and all these. And uh, 
So the idea is to teach people to think like those world changers, mm -hmm. to think outside the box, to train themselves, to, to build their own meta skills is one of the things, memory learning, speed reading, persuasion. Um, my, my favorite class to teach is, is uh, power presentation. And it's exactly what we were talking about, kind of all of this comes circle with the podcast. What's it for? If, if I want to teach you to be a better speaker, what do you want to get out of this speech? Most people don't ever define that. How do I want to persuade my audience to be here at one point and then here and here, and I get them to this point. And if I can get them to this point, they'll go get vaccinated. Or if I, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. whatever it is, if I know what that's for, then I know how to build that presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that process does interesting things like get people over their stage fright. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm, if I'm doing a talk and I'm only worried about you looking at me, do I look okay? What do you think? I get stage fright. If I worry about you're not listening, you're, I, I need to get you to lean in. I need you to do all the things we teach in magic school for magicians. I, I need you to clap at this point. I need you to go for, I need you to listen to this story, which is going to change your point of view and give it a an emotional punch, which can be a magic trick. But, you know, it, it all weaves together in interesting ways. So that's that's basically what the Wizard Venture is about. It, it's saying, let's take what we know as performers and magicians and things that's kind of esoteric knowledge and get it out there to a community of business people or community organizers or whatever it is to give them the new tools to handle change. It, it's really all about change and transformation. Mm, the new tools to handle change. And I'd love to go down the rabbit hole a little bit here. Um, so abracadabra and the power of voice. I'm so mm. I'm so invested and inspired by the power of voice. And that's why I believe in podcasting so much. And, mm. you know, we're talking about change, agents of change and Gandhi and and Merlin and how you how away with our words. And then, the, you know, there's um, a fantastic magician, uh, Canton, right? And uh, he yeah. has wonder words and the power of yeah. words. And I just want to hear from yeah. you more about the power of voice and words for mm -hmm. those listening, because everything Tobias has been sharing, uh, cues and, and, and kind of helping direct attention is all extremely applicable to being a talk show host it's every everything that he's talking about is so applicable to being a podcast host and helping guide the direction of the conversation so yeah could you talk to us about words and the power that they hold absolutely words and just the the sound of your voice because we we can talk with a light voice and be one person or we can draw our voice down and command an audience and it's all in the tone it's um, this is something if, if you ever take uh, training as a hypnotist, you learn about the power of voice. You also learn about the voice does direct the attention. It tells the story, but it's a tool for trance. And the hypnotist knows that if they speak in a certain cadence and they drop at a certain point, they're going to change your state. What most people don't understand is that we're in trance most of the time. And if you watch a TV show, you're in trance. You go into that world. And we, any storyteller has a chance to take you into their world. I read a book once about um, hypnotic marketing. And basically, the you, know, you can save reading the book. It says, if you start to tell a story, if you take people into another world, they go into trance and they become suggestible. Mm -hmm. Suggestible means that I say, you know, your left hand's getting lighter than your right hand and your left hand will eventually you know lift up and lift up and before you know it it's it, it feels lighter than the right hand um that's suggestibility it's something great speakers really understand getting people to respond in um in unison in a rhythmic unison i i i have a theory that um i'm a big fan of barack obama but i think the reason he that pushed him over the top when he was originally campaigning was getting his audiences in these big stadiums to chant together, yes, we can, yes, we can. And that puts you in trance. That makes you part of an audience. That makes you 
part of a group that you want to be part of a group and gives you an emotional lift. It changes your state. Tony Robbins talks a lot about changing your state and how easy it is. And it, it's, it's kind of a parallel method, message to what I'm doing there. But if you learn to control your voice, if you actually well, pitch, rhythm, volume, and the words you use, you can change someone's state just, just as they listen to you. And that's tremendously useful. And if you listen to the great newscasters or podcasters or whoever, you get drawn into that world. It just happens. But it's it's good to be conscious of it. It's good to be train train yourself. Yes. And it actually takes some training, right? Is what I'm hearing that you have to have some role models, you have to have some guides to to learn some of these skills so that you can convey your message in a more effective way. And you know, we're not talking about manipulating people against their will. We're talking about hmm. how to, you know, it, how to get your actual message to be communicated because oftentimes we think that what we say the other person understands but what's really happening is i have a mind movie and then i say some labels that you then interpret into your mind movie and those mind movies may not be the same they may not even be the same genre and so we need to do yeah. some more in order to have that message be transmitted and be communicated absolutely and uh, I, I think my training as a director is what led me to a lot of this because being a director is about creating, be, taking responsibility to create an experience for an audience. Mm -hmm. mm, an and experience. you learn very quickly that if you change the, the color of the light, they get a different experience. If you, you know, light the whole set big, they get one experience. If you light them, somebody in just a, a tight follow spot, they get a different experience. If you have the actors slow down their speech, that creates a different experience. And all of those things are real experiences. They're, they're real, you know, and you can learn as a speaker to do them. I, I, I have a workshop that I think might not happen because I, I only have like four people signed up for it and I need twice that. Um, but it's about theater games and simple things. When is that? that? As a performer, um, it starts April 7th for okay. six weeks i'll see if i can find four more people i mean i found myself yeah. so. <laughs> great but but the idea is to take a piece of magic or a story that you're telling and we'll put you through actually doing i i'm calling it theater games but it's, it's a series of exercises doing things like i want you to tell the story as slowly as you can mm -hmm. now i want you to tell it as fast as you can you to whisper the whole story and each time you do it you discover things about it you you take control of your own ability to express that thing in a different way and after you've done it 10 different ways you come back and, and you find out things like oh i memorized the script without trying i've cut all the extraneous movements because when i did it really fast i didn't have time to do anything but the essentials or when i did it really slow it felt ridiculous to do this thing that i didn't have to do or when i whispered it suddenly i discovered that there are parts that are better for the audience as is something that i'm offering in confidence this is a secret you know or that i shout at them and you really only discover those things in the whole mind body you can read about it you can go oh yeah i get that but you don't really discover it till you do it and so that's one of the secrets and one of the things we do in the wizard workshops for for the wizard venture it's so. just so the listeners know yeah. that that we are actually having an interview with a real wizard here so this is this is this is if if you've done any public speaking if you've done any performance i think that this is you you will understand the magic and what he's sharing here and how or if you've struggled with that then you'll really understand the value in, in what tobias is sharing so please go check out wizardventure.com check out tobiasbeckwith.com and i was wondering if you could share a little bit you know we have about another 20 minutes or so on this interview i i would sure. love it if you could share about the you know you said the, our role is to create an experience for the audience. Can you talk about the experience of astonishment? <laughs> yes. Um, I was taught about the experience of 
astonishment a little bit by by um Paul what's his last Paul Harris. Harris. Paul Harris, who is famous because he was probably by far the top close-up magician in Las Vegas for a while and made most of his money doing corporate walk around. You know, there, there, there are a hundred conventions in, in Las Vegas at any given moment. And he would get hired every night at a cocktail party or after dinner to make the rounds and do magic. Mm -hmm. And one night he went home and his house burned down with all his magic props in it. And he never got another house and he stopped doing magic. And we had Paul as a special guest at something, I think it was World Magics, which was a festival Jeff and I produced. And I picked him up at the airport in New York and drove him to Buffalo, which is where the thing was. So I got six hours in the car with him. And I had read all Paul's books at that point and learned a lot of his magic. And so I was just so excited. I was, you know, the, the fanboy. And I said, but I need to know why you stopped performing. And his answer was, well, I got really good at it. I got so good at it that I could hurt people's heads because there was a moment when what happened caused their entire worldview, their paradigm to shatter. He said, one day I, I, I did it in a room with, and he like ran to the wall and started banging his head against the wall. I went, wait, 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 wait. He said, I don't know what to do with that moment of astonishment. Hmm. The moment of astonishment is that moment when your world changes when you go, oh my God, I never knew that could happen. And it, hopefully it gets bigger. Hope, 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 hopefully things that you didn't know were possible are suddenly possible to you. Some people can deal with that, some can't. He said, most of them can't. And so I was telling weak jokes at that moment to shatter the moment of astonishment. And he said, I kind of don't want to perform again until I figured out what to do with that moment of astonishment. And so I, I think it's a tremendously important thing for magicians, for performing magicians to figure that out. That's why I keep going back to what's this for? What's your purpose in doing this? And I mean, we, we talk about it when we structure a show. We, we do, you know, Jeff's, Jeff's show used to open with him doing a spooky mask piece, producing masks, going through eight different characters in the course of two minutes. And that set a tone but then the next piece would be him doing the cards, the card manipulation, which was an upbeat, super high skill piece of magic. Mm -hmm. And so now, now the audience knew that we're in for a magical spooky time and we're in really good hands because this guy, I've never seen anybody do anything like that before. That must take tremendous skill. At that point, they didn't like him very well yet because he was in white face and he was scary and he was this kind of angry, mysterious character. So then we put his coin piece, which is an initiation for a boy from the audience, and it's hysterical. And at the end of the piece, if you don't love Jeff McBride, you're never going to love anybody. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. And not mm -hmm. only is it, yeah. is it hysterical, it's also extremely empowering for that young, the young person who comes up on stage, whereas some other magicians will make fun of and degrade basically the the guest on stage jeff yeah. initiates the young person on stage into sorcery and in, into magic and it's yeah. it's it's almost heart heartbreakingly beautiful and funny and inspiring yeah absolutely but 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 the point of the the three things is there was a reason for each piece mm -hmm. the first one was to set a tune and move uh, a tone and move the audience into a kind of a world and experience. The second one was to make them really comfortable. Because if you're not comfortable, if, if you think things are gonna go wrong with this performer, and I've seen too many magicians where I just, I'm just waiting for, okay, what's gonna go wrong? Because he's really not a master of his moment. Mm. And that, you can't watch him again, do the cards and know that, not know that he's a master. Mm. And uh, when, when I started working with him, nobody else in the world could do that card routine. And so, since then, he's taught it on video and things. And, you know, there are a lot of 18 year olds that can do it. But then there was no question. He was the best, the most skillful in the world. And it was just obvious. So we, we had a message for each piece to the audience that was subliminal, but there was a reason for the piece. 
Mm -hmm. So to connect this back into podcast land, I would say that that this is really important. Like each episode, you can uh, each person you're going to interview, we we can ask what what is my goal here? What is their goal here? What what is this for? You know, and to think of yeah. each piece as a performance. Each interview is a performance. Absolutely. Right? And, you know, so Tobias, as we're getting towards the end of this interview, I could ask you questions for hours and hours, and I really do hope that you'll come back on. Um, I have a couple rapid fire questions that I ask every guest, and then I'd like to open it up to you to to share uh, anything you'd like in, in closing. Um, Great. So the first question is, and you've already mentioned uh, The Empty Space, which is really cool, but I wanted to just, what's one book that you would like the world to read? Hmm. Other than my own. Oh no! It can be your own. It can absolutely be your own. Okay. My my favorite book that I've I've written is is The Wizard's Way, which is the secrets of the wizards of the past for world changers of today. Amazing, amazing. And what about a podcast that you listen to? Um. Boy, there are so many that I love. Um, I I think the one I mentioned, the Jason Calacanis, This Week in Startups because awesome. you're going to be introduced to a lot of people who are changing the world in interesting ways. Amazing. That's and amazing. Yeah, the, the, the other one I like is um, Debbie Millman Design Matters. It's one of the oldest podcasts out there. And she interviews people like your audiences, the mm -hmm. top creators. She, she teaches at the New School and um, in New York and it's design and branding. But mm -hmm. she talks to authors and artists and designers and people people like us that I think mm -hmm. of, people who are really creative and really, and she talks about their experience in life. How did you, you know, how did you grow up? How did you, you know, get here? And uh, it, it's very New York centered, which I like because you know, I lived, lived in New York 20 years and I still feel like I'm a New Yorker and I miss that intellectual energy that that you find there yeah when so. creators get together it's a really inspiring powerful thing and now since yeah. you're a magician um uh okay first of all i'm curious what what is one piece of magic that you just absolutely love and i think that will that might be more for the magicians who end up listening to this and that's okay and then i'm going to ask you a question for non-magicians but what is a piece of magic that you just love hmm let me think yeah, take your time. I can tell one of one of my favorite experiences watching magic ever was watching Norm Nielsen do his manipulation of cards and coins. And the thing I loved about it was the absolute gentle precision that there was never a sense of I'm making something happen. It was just here it is and bang, there it is. And it looked like real magic and it was delightful. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that would certainly be one of them. Um, I'm, you know, several of Jeff's pieces are my favorites and, and continue to be. Um, certainly the coin piece we talked about, his piece with the water bowls, I think is, is a masterpiece that mm -hmm. almost nobody else can touch. Mm -hmm. um, there, I, I saw a magician, a French magician at a convention, Jean-Pierre Valerino, I believe his name was, who had an elegance with card magic that was unbelievable. You couldn't believe, you almost couldn't believe he was human. It was like dancing hands, you know, it, 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 it was, and, and no extra moves, no, no, no tells, no nothing. I don't usually love card magic, but in his hands, I could have watched it all day. Mm. So th those are a few. That's amazing. Thank yeah. you for that. I love I love hearing about magicians' favorite experiences with magic. And now for the audience, who is who have never touched a magic prop, who have never learned a trick, or maybe they've learned one but they've not done it and performed. What what would you recommend for uh, the novice, the new the newcomer to this magical world? What could they do to start, or where could they go mm. to start? Um. There are lots of books. It depends on whether they think they might be serious about magic or not. If they think they might be serious, there's a book called The Amateur Magician's Handbook by Henry Hay, which is to me the best introduction for somebody that thinks they really wanna learn about magic. 
other than that, where would I send you? Um, I don't know. For, for somebody that just wants to begin. There's so much on YouTube and that kind of thing. I hesitate to send spend people there. And yet it's a really good place to see something and then learn to do it. Mm -hmm. What if about uh, Magic Flicks or the Magic and Mystery School? Would those be good resources for, for someone new to it? Or would you recommend more like one book? Because obviously with Magic, there is a huge world of Magic and a huge lineage. And it is an art. So it can yeah. be overwhelming. So I love the idea of the Amateur Magician's Handbook, like a, a single resource uh, for for new people. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't recommend Man Magic Flix right now because I don't know if it's really coming back or not. Mm -hmm. They they had a big business problem, and lost funding, and lost lost control of their site and that kind of thing. I I totally love the concept and the the spirit behind it that Stefan Vanell put together, and he and Jeff and his team put together a really great resource. But at this point, I don't think you can even get into the site. Oh, I'm glad so. I got it while I did because that was an incredible compendium. But yeah. the Magic and Mystery School offers a free some free resources upon signing up. Is that right? We do. Um, certainly. Um, if, if you sign up for our, um, as a member, if you go to not, not the $25 level, but the 50 or a hundred dollar level, which it might sound like a lot, but that's for a year of live podcasts, plus some bonus teaching material. Plus you have access to all of the episodes that we've ever done. So there's 520 episodes there now, I think. And uh, for for $50, you know, it's hard to beat that. It's amazing. Because they're, you know, and, uh, but, but a lot of what you get on the Monday night isn't teaching tricks. Some of it is. However, used to be when, when we were closed to the general public, we did teach tricks. And we, we had a thing called Wisdom Wednesday for the last six months where we would teach tricks every week because it was a closed audience. Well, when it's open to anyone, which it is when we, we publicize it on the web, we don't want to give away trick secrets and we don't teach tricks. We, we talk about who's doing this and this kind of magic. And, you know, la last night we did a thing on magic in Philadelphia. Next week, Jeff is doing one. Um, he's interviewing Piff the Magic Dragon, um, who is moving to a bigger theater at the Flamingo and has a lot to talk about about that and yeah. who has an interesting approach to magic. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not just tricks. It's an interesting character with interesting story with, you know, with his little Mr. Piffle's dog and all these things. And I, I just love it. But it's yeah. that that's what that does. It, it's a great introduction to the world of magic because we always show tricks. We always show magic. We always talk about or talk with great magicians. But uh, it's a community, and, yeah, which I think is important for for new magicians to be around. Uh, Jeff talked to me about this when I first met him. Oftentimes, new magicians will work at a peer level, and so it's very hard to get better. And so when when magicians are around people who are better than them, they can be brought up. And so it's so important to have sangha, as we say in the yoga community, or like a, a, yeah. a community of like minded people. So yeah. Tobias, as we're wrapping up here, I want to open this space up to you to share anything that's on your heart or mind for our listeners. Um, okay. I think the the great message of magic and the thing that has drawn me to it over the years is that the world is a bigger place than you imagine it is. And I, I love, there's a Mary, Marian Williamson quote that people aren't afraid that they don't have any power. Your greatest fear is that you have ever greater power than you can imagine. And therefore you're responsible to do something with that. And to me, that's the great joyful message of the magician is guess what you don't have to suffer through life you can create the life that you dream about you can create the world that you dream about and magicians are here to point the way to that my my do bus new business the wizard venture is here to help you train yourself to break out of your box and become more powerful because it's so rewarding and it feels so good to do that I love that message. Thank you so much for sharing that with the audience. I am 
mystified and blown away that uh, I get to interview folks like you that I've connected. Ever since I connected with Jeff, my life has only become more magical, 100%, more magical every month, more and more and more. And so I'm, I'm really grateful mm -hmm. to connect with you. I'm really excited about Magic Quest. Magic Quest is, is coming up and I, I cannot yes. wait to experience it. And so for the listeners who want to connect with Tobias, please head over to Wizard venture.com one word wizardventure.com also tobias beckwith.com and um i i would love it if you'd come back on i feel like we could talk about a million things for for many hours so this was just the the first phase fantastic thanks so much kaylee yeah it was wonderful having you yeah. and have a yeah. magical rest of your week you too take care you too be well Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Be On Air. I hope you enjoyed it and are now one step closer to turning on your mic and broadcasting your message to the world. Are you ready to start your own podcast and amplify your brand? Or are you struggling to get your show in front of engaged audiences? I can help you on your broadcasting journey. Get in touch with me and apply for a strategy session if you want to discuss your podcast idea. You can reach me at www.podcast-farm.com. I'm on all the social media. Until next time, my friends, I'm Kaylee Marks. Thanks for tuning in to Be On Air.